Welcome to the Talent Development Hot Seat, a show where I interview business executives, talent development professionals, and thought leaders to find out what has been successful and challenging in the world of talent development. My objective is to share ideas, valuable lessons, tools, advice, and trends. My hope is that all of this will ultimately help you, the listener, expand your knowledge, grow your career, and accelerate your success as a talent development professional. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Talent Development Hot Seat. I am your host, Andy Storch, and I am so grateful that you are joining me today for an interview with Lucretia Hall. And Lucretia is the Director of Learning and Development for North America at Software One, a $7 billion platform, services, and technology company helping businesses achieve their dreams through technology solutions and migration to the cloud. Lucretia lives in Santa Cruz with her husband and son. And I am excited to have her on today to talk about some things she's been working on and some of her uh, passions and focus, especially around uh, coaching and building high-performing L&D teams through strategy. So, Lucretia, welcome to the Talent Development Hot Seat. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, great to have you on. Of course, we met uh, through our mutual connection, Jill Cohn, who was on this podcast a while back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were just saying that the two of you are friends and keep in touch. And I think that's great because one of the things that I've learned in, in doing this, well, really for my own success over time, but interviewing a lot of L&D um, leaders, talent development leaders, that uh, having a network and other people you know within the industry to call on when you have questions, mm -hmm. issues, goals, whatever it is, can be so valuable. Have you found that to be really useful for you as well? Absolutely. <laughs> My, um, my former colleagues from, from Intuit and the other places that I've worked, that it's just invaluable to, to build a relationship with them and, and um, you know, keep it going, keep checking in with them, asking for advice and, and mentorship. And we, um, you know, we trade so much and we help each other. Um, and, and it just helps us go so much faster when we, when we work together in that way. Excellent. Yeah. And that's <clears throat> kind of what this podcast is all about too, is just, um, you know, creating a platform mm -hmm. for people to be able to share knowledge and, uh, and learn from yeah. each other. So uh, before we get into some of that, I'd love to go back and share some of your background and maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about how you got to where you are today. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, <laughs> I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I come from a family of kind of social workers, teachers, professors, builders, and um, even as a little kid, though, I thought, I can't, I don't think I can teach fourth graders. Uh, so it wasn't until I was, wasn't until I was um, working that I discovered L&D. Um, I started out actually as a salesperson and, um, and I was doing a, um, a project, I was doing catering sales and worked in this beautiful facility. And uh, I would work really closely with businesses and they would bring their events to me and they had L and D departments and they were doing this, these, these, you know, teaching and facilitation. And so that's how I discovered it. And I started out at uh, Micron Technology, uh, which is in Boise, Idaho, and really worked my way up through experience. I had some amazing mentors at that company. Um, and so um, began facilitation and, and doing um, a kind of lead, a leader teacher network, setting that up at, at Micron. Um, and then I and then I went to the um, university space for uh, a very short time, but had some good experiences there. Uh, and then I and then I jumped to Intuit, and Intuit is uh, is is really where I I, I sort of learned the craft um, really deeply. They provided amazing um, training to the L and D department, uh, and I had some incredible mentors there: Jill Brooks Fisher, um, just just so many people that were, were willing to, to teach me and to help me grow. And, and then I, I played in the consulting space for just a, a moment too when I had my son. Uh, and then I took my position at, uh, at, software, at Software One. And I, I often joke with my um, vice president that uh, I, I, I went to medical school at, um, at Intuit, but now I get to actually practice the, the, the trade. <laughs> Cool. So even going from like a manager to director role, um, just re it just grew me so much. And and software one is a place uh, and a, a a reason that people love working there 
is that they hire smart people and they let you do your job. So they really, you know, just really push you to, um, to, to, to think of yourself as, as a business owner and to own uh, whatever your, your role or your department or whatever you're, you're working in. Uh, and so I've just had um, much more experiential um, at, at Software One and, and, um, and people at Software One too, the, the other cultural thing that we're really well known for is, is that people really genuinely help each other and love each other and take care of each other. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great place to, to be at this point. That's great. Well, you're really selling the culture right now. If you're hiring women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> but I, I wanted to come back to you, you said, first of all, uh, you said, you know, you don't want to teach four, fourth, uh, fourth graders. And uh, I can definitely relate to that. We both have kids around the same age. We talked about that. And I love uh, teaching my children. But for whatever reason, um, I have no problem getting up in front of a room of adults and facilitating a workshop. But the few times I've done it in front of kids, you know, when I volunteer for junior achievement or something like that, I get so nervous. I feel like they look right through you. Like there's just, uh, you know, there's no hiding anything in front of it. Not that I'm trying to hide anything. I, I like to think of myself. As <laughs> um, it's just a different Maybe that experience. Was it. It's intimidating, right? So uh, I have much, much respect and admiration for all of my friends who are teachers out there. Uh, who do get up in front of those kids every day. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your sales experience. We've had many, uh, quite a few people on who started, got their start in sales before moving to learning and development. Uh, what have you drawn from that experience? What was valuable for that that you, you still might use today? Oh, easy answer. It's the focus on the customer uh, and the, the, you know, the, the, the customer saying what they want and need and really connecting to thought and feeling um, to their past experiences, to their, you know, their beliefs, their, their network, you know, and, and, and mining all of that. So you can figure out how to make an experience that's, that's truly great for, for them. Yeah. And when you say focus on the customer, I 100% agree with you. Um, how does that translate to what you're doing today? It's everything. It's the foundation of, of the work itself. Uh, when, when I started at Software One, they had a lot of data. This was about two and a half years ago. Mm. And there was no, um, you know, we, we built L&D at Software One uh, in North America. And uh, the one thing that they were, they were um, able to pr provide kind of in droves, and I think that a lot of companies have, is, is a lot of data. So we had... Um, you know, we had um, customer, we had a, a survey results, you know, from years and years of surveys. Um, we had tons of notes from, you know, our executive team getting together and, and talking about what they wanted to see for, our, for, for all of our people. Um, and then the very first thing we did was we went and interviewed customers. So we went out, of course, and, and interviewed our, our obvious stakeholders, you know, our vice president of North America, um, interviewed a bunch of market leaders. You know, in our business, it's we are a sales first company. So, the market leaders, um, market directors across the region have teams of people that report to them, and then they have these wide functional teams. You know, they're inside sales people, um, they're they're technical BDMs, um, our, our our technical solutions team. They have all this huge span of people. Uh, and so we, um, we found, you know, individuals throughout all those different groups and interviewed them and talked to them about, you know, what are your problems today and what are you experiencing and what would you like to see happen? What would be, you know, really meaningful for you? And when we brought all that data together and culled it and, and found the themes, you know, then we went back to them again and said, does this sound right? And you know, to our, to our VP, this is what people are saying, and here's how it's the same or different than what you're thinking and seeing. Uh, and so we, we built kind of this coalition of, of opinion about what, what we wanted to, to create for the organization, at least for the next couple of years. <laughs> it's always changing. Um, but, um, you know, we not only, we connected with the customer, we, we made sure that um, our, our key stakeholders were um, getting what they they wanted and we we built you know we it was the beginning of the change it was really the first step in our change management process that we we built this kind of agreed upon um, opinion about where people were today and where they needed to be uh, in the future 
Oh, really cool. So I'm thinking right now that, uh, like you said, a lot of companies are sitting on a lot of data and companies have been using employee mm-hmm. surveys and even customer surveys for years. But I feel like a lot of companies, they use, they send those out, but then they don't really do anything with the data because they don't really quite know how to leverage that. So you're saying you actually took action on that by looking mm-hmm. at, okay, what exactly do our customers want? How can we change our programs or change what we're offering? Um, so what's an example of something that, because I, I want to dig into this. I think it's something that where a lot of people can get value from. What's an example of something sure. where you went and made a change based on that, that survey data? Well, we, we really built our whole strategy based on the data that we had, you know, qualitative and quantitative. Um, and what we said was, um, based on all of this, um, we, we, we think we have five competencies. Of course, you know, I think Center for Creative Leadership publishes something like 27 leadership competencies. We can't teach 27 <laughs> different, you know, build and, and create and manage 27 workshops. So we had to narrow and we narrowed to five. And mm-hmm. we said, you know, we think these five things, these five competencies are um, what people most need right now, what, they're, what, they're, what, they're, what they need to grow into um, the most. So an example is we said, we need our people to be able to build high-performing teams, um, whether people report to them or it's a functional relationship. And a lot of them were, we're a really flat organization. So we built a workshop around um, uh, building high-performing teams. And we used um, a lot of Patrick Lencioni's work, a lot of Goldman's work, Marshall Rosenberg. So we used all these different people to inform the workshop that we built. Um, and then we also used it to inform um, a lot of the coaching and the intact team work that, that we do also. So we have sort of this foundation of really belief um, and, and content that we try and spread out through everything that we touch. That is great. So you're, you're responding to what people are actually asking for, what they need, what the customers want, um, and then building programs based on that. So you mentioned mm-hmm. high-performing teams, and we were planning on getting into this idea of really building a high-performing L&D team, um, you know, mm-hmm. connecting it to the strategy, you know, the company strategy, and of course, your HR or talent strategy. So tell me a little bit more about your approach to building a sure. high-performing L&D team. Sure. Uh, well, I think the first part of the approach was was creating and testing um, the, the strategy that we came up with. So our strategy is that we have in-person workshops. We have those five. And we believe that, um, you know, blended learning um, or, or really learning certain types of it need to be in person. Um, so doing really, you know, deep work with somebody about their mindsets and having them be vulnerable and get into, you know, a group with another person and, or bring their own, you know, former bad conversations and be able to, to talk about those, that, that's in-person work. So we built those five workshops. Um, then we said, um, we also need to get into people's teams. Um, you know, you can come to us. Um, at, at our corporate headquarters and have this experience, but we need to, we need to come to you. Um, you know, the leader, leader maybe comes to us, but then we want to go to his or her team um, and bring that content according to um, what, that, what they feel like they, they need right now, what would be most beneficial to them. So we, we cater it according to where the team's at. And then we said, um, we also need um, a coaching practice. And a couple of us in L and D are certified coaches, and so we created a targeted coaching practice. Uh, so we we kind of went after some people, and then we got quite a few volunteers uh, that wanted wanted to receive coaching. Uh, but we offer um, we offer coaching again based on our you know kind of our foundation of content. We offer coaching to you know all of our market directors, um, all of you know all of our leaders really. Um, and then, you know, our, our high performing and, and driven individual contributors as well. And then the final part of that strategy is uh, we work hand in hand with, with HR. Uh, so we're, we're completely aligned with the HR um, and we consult each other on, the orga- on organizational development. We have a different skill set. 
and um, we really help each other um, uh, you know furthering the organization a, a really simple and good example of that is you know obviously in workshops and and coaching and intact teams I get so much exposure to people and so I can help um, our business and HR you know understand what's 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 going on for people and where they need to develop and you know how we can push them into the to, you know into the next position um, what they're looking for with their all of those kinds of you know really personal things that um, that I can discover through just being around people with of course the caveat of you know coaching is confidential so it's never you know it's there's a there's a line in the sand right but but just um, providing that to the org and then of course we in l and d we have a lot of organizational development expertise and when we partner with HR and really sit at the table with HR and the business um, we can we can help a lot in that space so there's a four-part strategy um, workshops intact team development coaching um, and um, organizational development and this year we're pivoting and adding a fifth which is uh, that we're we're going into the learning experience platform space, and so we are, to your point, um, going to um, start offering blended learning, especially um, in sales enablement training, because we, we it moves so fast yeah. um, that we have to find a way yeah, to do this um, online and have it be really um, effective. So getting the whole L&D team um, lined up behind that strategy um, and 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 understanding their their impact and their focus mm. um, was was so key to that team buying in and 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 becoming engaged. It was easy; <laughs> we were doing it together. Yeah. Uh, but um, but you know, feeling them them really feeling how much they could serve um, their peers and the organization, um, the impact that they could have. You know, every every day. It's it's you know it's wonderful to work in that kind of environment. Yeah. I, I have so many questions about all the things you mentioned, but I want to get back to the core of this, which is on building that high performing L and D team. And you mentioned sure. that, you know, everyone is coming together to um, take this approach, this blended approach and the, the different steps, you know, the workshops, intact team coaching, et cetera. Uh, and then they're all aligned on this. Were there steps you took within the team to make sure that everybody got aligned in the beginning? Because you know, it's easy for the boss, whoever it is, to come and say, hey, this is our mission, let's go do it. But that doesn't always mm -hmm. work if you don't really sit down and take the time to understand everybody's perspectives, where are people coming from, what are their values, what are their motives, um, and then how do you get them all working together as a team? So is there anything else that you did there as an L&D team to make sure everybody was performing, you know, going in the same direction? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot there. <laughs> so, um well, I think first of all, it's it's just a deep respect for people and their strengths. So one of our philosophies um, in in our in our L and D work is that um, people have a set of strengths, and they we all operate at our best when we're offering up our strengths. Uh, and so using the Gallup Strengths Finder and discovering what everyone's strengths are, and then finding every single possible way to give them the work that they're already strong in. So I always use this example, like I love strategy, it's my top strength, you know, blah, blah, strategy. But uh, one of the people on my team, Courtney Reynolds, she, um, her, she has a strength in communication. I don't have any strength in communication. <laughs> so I might, you know, I might write the strategy, but um, she is absolutely going to be the one who, you know, markets it and figures out what people, you know, what people um, will connect with and, yeah. you know, what's really going on in the organization and how to communicate really effectively. Hmm. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other is, um, is building trust. And, and this is the foundation of building a high performing team. It's, it's something that um, all of our leaders are, are learning and doing. You know, how do you build, how do you build trust from, from the get-go with your team? Uh, and, and these are really, you know, when I say it, it's so obvious, everyone knows this stuff, but, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's connecting with people, right, under, learning about them. Um, Harvard Business Review just came out with a, an article talking about how, you know, a lot of trust is just, remembering and asking about 
you know, your, your, you know, how's Steve, how's, how's your baby, you know, what's going on, you know, you got, you, you know, you, re you wrecked your car last week, how's, how's, how's that, you know, what are you doing with that? I mean, it sounds really, you know, it sounds kind of trite, but I think when we slow down enough to know people um, and to build a, you know, a work friendship, um, that, that it, it, it builds trust. And then, of course, there's, you know, there's um, being open and inclusive, you know, being non-prejudiced and non-biased and making that really evident, um, doing what you say you're going to do, um, having that really high ratio there. Um, and I think knowing what you're doing or saying when you don't, you know, like I, you know, I, I, I don't know how I, I don't have the answer here and, and I'm nervous about it. And or I have, you know, I have some anxiety about this because I'm not sure what's going to happen. Now, what do you all think? What do you, you know, what, what are your opinions? Um, and finally, I think holding space for people. So I was just working with someone else from our team the other day and I said, you know, and she's brand new. And I said, you know, you can tell me what's inside your, what you're thinking that you're nervous to say, and it won't go anywhere. You can, you can say it to me and I'm going to help you process it and I'm not going to judge you for it. Um, and I'm not going to tell anybody else. Right. And, and I think it's really important. Yeah, it's super important at work that, that people can feel safe. Um, and, you know, I always joke and tell people, okay, if, you, if you're embezzling from the company or you're, you know, you're a risk, you know, I'm, to yourself, you know, I'm going to say something. But, you know, we have this container and, and this conversation is never leaving this container. And, and, and I think that's how l and has built a lot of trust in the organization. People know that um, they can they can talk to us and and in L and D we know that we can we can talk to each other about what we're scared of or or you know have anxiety around and and that's okay and we can say we're scared we can say we have anxiety and <laughs> you know it's 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 safe to do that um, and then finally I think the other uh, sort of thing that we all know about um, is is change management and so um, you know building. Um, building buy-in from the beginning, um, you know, bringing people together to just talk about, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the future state um, and where are we today and, you know, what, what, what kind, you know, what are we trying to create and, and building, you know, just getting, bringing out everyone's opinions. And these things are, uh, they're easy when you talk about them, but you actually have to um, structure each um, you know, each one of your staff and offsite, I think you have to have the end game or at least the, you know, six months out in mind and then build back from there. So it is, um, there's, I think there's time and, and structure that, um, that you, you know, as the leader that you put in place. So you do create, you do build that, that but then the conversation that happens within that agenda is completely, you know, open. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. Now you just said that you don't have a strength of communication and you just laid out an entire plan for uh, building rapport, trust, and psychological safety on your team. That's pretty, uh, it's pretty impressive. I'd say you're, you're pretty good at communication. Um, <laughs> no, okay. but I, those, those things are so important. You know, you talked about um, the communication and the trust and uh, you talked about, you said safety, I'm adding psychological safety because mm -hmm. that is pretty popular. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk about, which is mm -hmm. giving people space to feel comfortable in talking about whatever they need to talk mm -hmm. about being vulnerable, as you mentioned, um, which is something that I hear a lot in like the personal development space, but not so much yet in the corporate world that, Hey, we provide space and allow people to be vulnerable, recognizing that that is how we build rapport and how we build trust is when people mm -hmm. feel comfortable, you know, talking about whatever is bothering them. They're nervous in a situation. They're worried about failing okay. with something, and and they're able to then mm -hmm. ask for help. And you also said that uh, this is obvious. Everyone knows this stuff. I wrote it down. I don't think that's true. I think that you know you might take it for granted being in the world you're living in or being in the culture you're in, where it seems very pervasive, but not a lot of people are aware of this or doing this. So I'm really glad that you're. Mm -hmm you're talking about it. Um, you, you mentioned the trust uh, and I want to go back to, you know, having those conversations and, you know, getting the team aligned and making space for that. So 
you, you've done mm -hmm. all those things. You, you've kind of set that strategy. Um, you also talked about um, making sure that you are working with the HR team, which I really appreciated mm -hmm. because you said you have um, <clears throat> sort of information coming to you, right? That you can help them with succession planning right. and they're doing. So are you purposely setting up workshops where you have um, some type of assessment uh, vehicle or coaching there where people can observe participants and be able to, you know, go back and communicate what they're seeing um, to, to help with the, you know, all of those, those things on the, on the back end. Mm -hmm. Well, we do, um, we do uh, 360s and 180s and we also do interview based um, 360s. So we, we, we built a 360 and 180 tool uh, that we, that we do um, in our intact teams. Um, so we don't just, you know, let it fly <laughs> because uh, we feel like people need to have a, a place to, to talk through it once they receive it back and get really good, good coaching. Uh, and then we do um, interview-based 360s where people send us oh, 10 names or so and, and we conduct in-person um, interviews and, and actually write up um, a pretty lengthy report for them, lots and lots of quotes you know, and then some interpretation, but mostly just straight quotes. And, and it's amazing, you know, what people see and how much usually agreements when they're not talking to each other, they're just talking to us. But um, we can find all these themes for people and, and help them build um, a development plan. Um, a lot of the um, kind of, uh, you know, assessment that happens is, is, is going on um, more at the, the leadership team team levels. So wh whatever, whichever team it is, our, our access to those people are, are helping us um, uh, and, and vice versa, they're having access to us. So they can be telling us, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to go. Um, I want to help with L&D. You know, I want, I want to grow myself in this way in this, in this year. And so being able to um, take that back to their leader and our, our management team in NORAM um, can, be, can be so helpful, you know, as we do our strategic planning, um, as we, you know, look at the organization and figure out, okay, well, here's our strategy and here's the work. Now, who do we, you know, who do we have in place? And I can be like, oh, you know, Megan wants to work on, you know, change management. Let's give her this change management process, you know, because, because I know that she's interested in that practice and we've talked about it. And, you know, Megan, Monami, by the way, now has like four change management projects <laughs> in addition to her, in, in addition to her job, but she wants to get into that. Um, and so that, that's a, you know, that's a, an example of how we can, we, we really help bring people together with their strengths and what, what the organization needs and, and, and with the work and, and just serve people and, and help them get further into what they, they enjoy or, or love. Yeah, really empowering people to leverage their strengths and do more of what they enjoy and, and help them get into yeah. flow and really add value to the organization. Mm -hmm. um, one more question mm -hmm. on all the, the things that you've been building there. Um, so you mentioned these different development programs. You mentioned the, the um, the power of bringing people together in person and why that's so important, especially at the higher levels um, when you want real learning to take place. I really appreciate you saying that as someone who <clears throat> feels passionate about that and who runs a lot of in-person workshops. And I know there's a lot of value mm -hmm. to digital uh, and, and virtual learning as well. And you being a software company, I'm sure you find ways to incorporate that. Um, but as you're building mm -hmm. those things out, uh, are you using any partners for those? Or are you building everything in-house um, everybody does it differently, and I think a lot of people are always curious what others are doing. We've built in-house so far, uh, so you know, in those in those couple of years, we've built the the five workshops, and then a lot of um, intact team content that's based on those. Um, we share everything, so I think uh, you know, Software One again is 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 a special place in that we we have a culture of of helping. Uh, so, you know, every time I build something, I send it to my team, I get their feedback actually and their help. Uh, and, 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 and so we're, we're creating sort of a, you know, a, a, a Microsoft Teams, um, you know, 
database of, of these, these, these workshops and this content that we, we deliver to teams. And, and it always changes a little bit, um, but, um, uh, but it's been, it's, it's been um, uh, really uh, uh, impactful for us to, to so far kind of home, home grow it. Of course, we use all the research and all of our experiences yeah. right. um, from the past. There's, yeah, just so much, so much good stuff available now. I was just reading um, Thanks for the Feedback uh, recently. And yeah, yeah, the same authors of Masterful Conversations. Um, and I, you know, I, I read it and I, I built a, an intact team workshop um, teaching people how to get really good at receiving feedback. And now that team is doing, all the leaders on that team are doing a 360 and we're going to have an offsite about the 360. Um, so there's a lot of content and, and, and I think, you know, identifying the really good content is, is maybe the hardest part, right. um, but it's there. Um, and so once you have it, you can, yeah, you can pretty quickly turn it into um, something that's really valuable. That's cool. So you're reading these books and then turning them into programs. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. And the coaching, is that all being done in-house as well? Or do you use any partners for that? It is. Yeah, okay. we're being, I was a certified coach. Um, uh, again, thanks to Intuit for the, for the training that I received there. So I was a certified coach. I've been practicing for quite a few years when I, when I started at Software One. Um, and then um, my colleague, Courtney, just recently went to Harvard and got her, um, got her coaching. Uh, so, so we have a, a a couple of us that are that are um, practicing in, um, coaching th throughout North, throughout North America. Great. Okay, <clears throat> let me switch gears here and ask you a few of my more standard questions. Um, the first is, okay. what has been your proudest moment or your proudest accomplishment in talent development so far? Um. I suppose that um, <laughs> it's uh, well. It's really recent. Um, I mean, I could I could answer. You know, there's lots of helping other people and serving. I guess if if you're asking about my proudest moment for yeah. me, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was awarded the. Um, I can't even remember what we call it actually. Like the most influential woman or the woman at the in North America that's that's kind of helped other women the most or had a positive impact on um, women at the company. Um, we started a women in technology group a couple of years ago, um, and it's an inclusive network, men and women. And uh, we've, been, um, we've been inviting in speakers. Um, we've been having um, uh, you know, sessions with our, with our leadership, um, bringing research into the company to to help people understand um, really the broader, you know, uh, being inclusive in general and what that means for enabling people's strengths. Um, but there was something about getting that award that was just, it really touched my heart. That is so cool. Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, that's, it's always great to be recognized for any of our hard work or anything we do, but that's an award that says, hey, you have been influencing and helping others. You are a great yeah. role model and um, other people look up to you. And so that's why you got it, which obviously well-deserved. Very cool. Um, well, I got to switch gears and ask the other side, which is what has been your biggest failure or mistake and what did you learn from it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's really easy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's lots of mistakes. Um, you know, the 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 most difficult um, thing for me in the last couple of years is, you know, I mentioned we are truly an international company, and um, and and I think that um, it I continue to to work really hard to understand other cultures and how. Um, and how different we are culturally. And I always thought, oh, I'm American, you know, uh, we have, I mean, we're everyone, you know, like live here long enough and you'll find your people, you know, you'll totally. make your friends, everyone's here. Um, but it's on an international stage, it, it, it really is different. Um, the management styles are different. Um, you know, people's mindsets and beliefs are different. How they operate at work is really different. 
you know, telling, telling a, you know, a Swiss executive that you want him or her to be um, vulnerable and like really get down and get, let's expose your mindsets. And they're like, why, why, you know, we're, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm good. You know, I yeah. like, here's the strategy and here's how we're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so, so really deeply understanding that I'm not, there yet and and um i have to um i have to receive coaching on it i have to you know try really hard and under you know to understand um the communication differences and language and culture and all of these differences i don't have it figured out yet it's yeah. it's, it's hugely challenging and and really important because we're trying to take l d global um and so you know, in order to do that, I have to, I have to figure out, um, you know, how to best help and influence and receive, um, from, from all of these other, uh, these other, um, countries and cultures that are, that are out there. Yeah. Uh, that is a big one. So yeah, making, not making those yeah. assumptions, uh, which we often might do about what will work and what the cultural differences might be or mm -hmm. might not be. And, I can tell you, you know, from experience, I've been very lucky to uh, have the opportunity to facilitate client workshops all over the world across Europe and Asia and, and Latin America. And uh, I'm always fascinated by the cultural differences and um, mm -hmm. try to, you know, uh, adapt and, and, you know, shift a little bit so I can make sure that I'm coming across and still being effective, you know, maybe use less references to American football. Uh, wherever I go, right? <laughs> but there's, but I I use that as an example, as a joke to to remind people that there's a lot of colloquialism that we have in our language, you know, just terminology yeah. we use in day to day mm -hmm. within our own countries that doesn't translate to other countries. And people are like, I, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Even going from the US to UK, I work with a lot of people from the UK and they say tons of things that I'm like, what are you talking about? That <laughs> doesn't even make sense. And we speak the same language. Um, Lucretia, are there any uh, trends that you're following in talent development that um, you know you're you're tracking or think make a might make a big impact soon on how we do our work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of what's out what what out what's out there right now. Um, I think first off is you know how do we how do we get our arms around um, blended learning and do it really really well. Uh, I don't think a lot of people have it figured out yet. We're trying to find them <laughs> since we're going into this uh, <laughs> this place this year. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and and especially you know in blended learning, how do we generate? How do we enable people to create super high quality, useful customer customer generated content, or sorry, user generated content? Um, how do we um, how do we do stuff super fast that's that's relevant that's you know in hand, literally in hand, um, you know on the drive to to your next client or whatever it's you know it's truly just in time. Uh, it's 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 hard, uh, and you know for us we have so much sales content and so much product content and yeah. uh, and a lot of it's extremely complex. Mm. Um, and where, you know, all the lines get blurred between jobs and roles and the work that you do and, you know, what's the scope of what you need to know and what do you need to know now? So it's just, it's just a bear. Uh, and, you know, how do we use technology really effectively um, to, to teach all of that? Um, and what I, you know, I'm thinking about all of that. And then I'm also thinking about, you know, how do we manage this change? And, you know, how do we make it not just another platform? You know, the old learning learning platforms were basically libraries and you had your transcript there and you'd click to register, you know, and these new platforms are so much more dynamic and they mirror um, social, social media. And how do we get people to, how do we get the uptake? You know, how do we, how do we brand it and market it and, and, and create such high quality stuff that, you know, people just can't imagine not using it um right. it's it's yeah it's a big <laughs> and they don't, and they don't you know they don't roll their eyes and go oh that's it's this thing from hr they want us to use it's like right. it's something they want right. to go to and they want to leverage and they yeah just it's yeah super relevant mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. makes sense and i mean the blended learning thing very popular 
Uh, many companies are doing it well. There are partners. Uh, I, I work with clients on that as well and, and bringing in because I have so many different in-person workshops as well as a lot of digital solutions now that um, we're doing a lot more blended, blended learning. And really, the key mm -hmm. I'm finding lately is, is making it more of a journey, right? Like putting people, you know, creating a journey for people where they can go to the classroom. They have um, those things to reinforce the learning afterwards. And you're doing some of that already, which you, which you talked about earlier and having mm -hmm. The reinforcement, having the coaching, um, all the things that go into it. So I'd say you're, it sounds like you're already making some good progress there. Um, do you have any, uh, a book recommendation for us? What's a book that has made a big impact on you or that you often recommend to others? Um, I love, um, I love Patrick Len Lencioni's work. So um, the five dysfunctions of the team. Um, I, um, I also, I also um, follow kind of the EQ stuff. So I'm still a lover of, of Peter Senge, the fifth discipline. I think that's sort of the L and D Bible. Uh, and there's a, there's a um, facilitator's guide that goes along with that book. I've used that throughout my career. Um, and then of course I love, you know, difficult conversations and masterful conversations um, and um, you know, the Harvard negotiation project, all of, all of the work that, uh, um, that they, that they put out. Um, so I'd recommend I recommend all of those. But my latest read is is uh, thanks for the feedback and thanks. and it's it's excellent. It's 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 shifting. Um, it's about shifting um, feedback from I'm good at taking it to I'm good at seeking it out. Um, and I can actually yeah role model great service leadership and I can improve myself uh, and build trust along the way. Yes, um, I can tell you that uh, as much as I talk to people about the importance of getting feedback and that's how we improve seeking it out, it's, that's like next level stuff because it is difficult sometimes, even if you know yeah. it's going to help you um, to take that feedback, to be vulnerable and, uh, and listen and not get defensive. Yeah. Um, last question, Lucretia, for anyone listening who's looking for ways to accelerate their careers in talent development, what's one more piece of advice you would give to them? Um, if they're in the field of, of talent development and they want to accelerate their careers, ooh, um, I think we've touched on it, which is surround yourself with good people and, uh, and learn from them. Um, I think that we, we are in, we are in the, uh, you know, so that's, that's, you know, building up your, your board of people, finding um, people that you admire and, and making connections with them. Um, there's, you know, I, I, I was told so many great anecdotes at Intuit that I always go back to, but um, uh, Jill actually told me, you know, it, I've never gone to anyone and said, I admire you and I want to learn from you. And, you know, can I have an hour of your time a month and had them say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So getting, getting, getting good at, at, um, at building relationships. Um, and then I think the other thing is, you know, we're, we in, in L and D, you know, we, we tend to, um, serve others. We serve the organization. I think a big part of that is knowing the business. So becoming a better business person. Um, and the, the, um, Brooks, uh, Fisher at Intuit helped me with this. He's like, just start reading business stuff. So I got Barron's mm. and I got fortune and I got the economist and I nice. started really having a practice of and now I kind of can't do without them, you know, cause I, I just formed this practice of, of reading, um, a business journals and just becoming a lot more savvy about business in general. Yeah. Um, I think we can all use taking a finance course. I still need to take mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, being, being a true, you know, understanding business in general, and then obviously whichever, whichever, um, you know, field you're, you're currently practicing in that particular business that you're working in, um, is really important when you try and, and have the seat at the table that, that is so, so effective for L&D to have. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent with those. And, uh, knowing the business, I can tell you as a consultant who's worked with lots of people from HR and talent development, if you take the time to understand how a business works and, and get your business acumen down and understand the strategy, you will stand out 
you will absolutely, absolutely mm -hmm. stand out. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. who don't take the time to do that, frankly, and you'll be seen, you have a better chance of being seen as more of a partner in the business. And uh, as someone who is big on building a network and learning from others, I'm all about surrounding myself with people that uh, I can learn from and it can raise me up. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And that is a big reason why I am actually organizing my own conference later this year for talent development because I want to give people an opportunity to come together to network and to learn from each other and uh, I'll be mm -hmm. announcing more information about that soon. People can go find out uh, right. about that at talentdevelopmentthinktank.com and I'm really excited and I'm really excited that I got a chance to have you on today, Lucretia. This was really fantastic. So much great experience, information, wisdom was shared. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the Talent Development Hot Seat. Thank you, too. It's been my pleasure. All right. Take care.